Good morning again. Now let's open our Bibles to the book of Genesis. And today we are reading Genesis chapter 41. We will be reading from verses 17 through verse 32. Genesis chapter 41, verses 17 through verse 32. Let's all rise together when we found it in reverence for God and for the reading of his word. People of God, this is the word of your Lord. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Behold, in my dream I was standing on the banks of the Nile. Seven cows, plump and attractive, came up out of the Nile and fed in the reed grass. Seven other cows came up after them, poor and very ugly and thin, such as I have never seen in all the land of Egypt. And the thin, ugly cows ate up the first seven plump cows, but when they had eaten them, no one would have known that they had eaten them, for they were still as ugly as at the beginning. And then I woke. I also saw in my dream seven ears growing on one stalk, full and good, seven ears withered thin and blighted by the east wind sprouted after them. The thin ears swallowed up the seven good ears, and I told it to the magicians, but there was no one who could explain it to me. Then Joseph said to Pharaoh, the dreams of Pharaoh are one. God had revealed to Pharaoh what he is about to do. The seven good cows are seven years, and the seven good ears are seven years. The dreams are one. The seven lean and ugly cows that came up after them are seven years, and the seven empty ears, blighted by the east wind, are also seven years of famine. It is as I told Pharaoh. God has shown to Pharaoh what he is about to do. There will come seven years of great plenty throughout all the land of Egypt, but after them there will arise seven years of famine, and all the plenty will be forgotten in the land of Egypt. The famine will consume the land." And the plenty will be unknown in the land by reason of the famine that will follow, for it will be very severe. And the doubling of Pharaoh's dream means that the thing is fixed by God, and God will shortly bring it about. This is God's word. May God bless you with his word. Uncertainty is something that we do not like. Do you like having things uncertain? Do you not like not knowing what will happen tomorrow? Maybe some of you are applying to colleges. You've applied and you're waiting for your response. And not knowing and waiting can be very stressful, very painful. Maybe there's someone that you liked and you sent them a letter or you told them how you feel, and they told you to wait before they give you a response. You applied for a job, and you're waiting to see if you make it to the next round. There's so much uncertainty. There's uncertainty when we thought we were finally coming to a post-pandemic situation, and now all of a sudden, we're not so sure anymore. I don't know if any of you know anyone who had been affected by the tornadoes, but I'm sure you can imagine how uh, hard it will be not knowing what will happen, not knowing what had happened if, if the people that you care for are still alive or if they've uh, been taken through that terrible storm. There are uncertainties that we have in this life, and it robs us of our peace. It makes us feel anxious. But one of the things that we need to learn is we need to learn how to have faith in God despite these unknowns. We need to learn how to be confident in God and in the fact that God is God, even when we are unsure. You see, this is exactly what Pharaoh must learn. Because Pharaoh 
is afraid. He's anxious. And you can tell that Pharaoh is afraid by the way that he describes his dream. And if you compare the way that Pharaoh describes his dream to the earlier account when the narrator was giving and telling Pharaoh's dream, Pharaoh elaborates. And he elaborates on the the blighted ears of corn or grain, uh, wheat, and he's also focusing on the thin, gaunt cows. The way that Pharaoh describes him, he says these cows are poor, very ugly, and thin. And then he comments, they were cows that he had never seen in all the land of Egypt. He had never seen such pathetic and poor cows. And then he also speaks about how these cows, when they came up, they were these crazy mad cows that were eating the other cows. And maybe that might be the reason why Pharaoh was having a nightmare. Because if you imagine... You know, you've seen probably nature shows of lion eating like deer and gazelle. But can you imagine if the gazelles start eating each other? Well, the cows. Imagine if the cows start eating each other. And that's what Pharaoh sees. And when they ate them, they were still just as ugly, he says. What does it mean? Well, you see, Joseph recognizes that this is what Pharaoh is concerned about. And so Joseph responds to Pharaoh's fears, and he addresses the famine first. He speaks about them before he speaks about the good cows and the good grain. He reverses the order of the dream. But if you notice, Joseph is not speaking as a professional dream interpreter. He is not like one of the many magicians of Egypt. He is not like their wise men. No, instead, Joseph is here speaking as a prophet. He is speaking with confidence of the word the Lord. And so when he speaks, he doesn't need to interpret according to his wisdom, but he speaks with authority. And when the first thing we see is he refers to how these are actually one dream with two parts. They're not just two different dreams with two different messages like that of the cupbearer and of the baker where there were two separate dreams needing their own interpretation. But these two dreams are actually one dream. And the two dreams are significant because it is revealing what God is going to do And the seven cows and the seven ears of grain, they refer to seven years. The good cows refer to years of abundance, years of plenty. But the thin, ugly cows refer to famine. Now, famine, this famine would be so severe, it would devastate the land so much so that it would completely erase the years of plenty to the point where they wouldn't even be remembered. And this actually gives us a hint to what is to come in Exodus. You see, the people, well, we'll see, for those of you who are going to go to the retreat, we'll see that when the people forgot Joseph, They were not just simply forgetting about Joseph. They were forgetting about God. They were forgetting about how God provided throughout the famine, how God saved them, 
how God gave them life. But that's for the retreat. But here we see Joseph is foretelling of this severe famine. And normally, when you think of famine, and if you were a king or of the pharaoh, this famine would have been bad news. It's like being president when you have crazy inflation, when the price of gas keeps going up and up, the price of food, the price of clothes, essentials are going up and up. It makes you look bad. It makes you the problem. And if you were the pharaoh at this time and there was a seven-year famine, that is something bad. It would have been seen as a curse from God. Because you have to understand, Egypt did not depend on rainfall for their crops. They didn't need rainfall because they had the Nile. The Nile was a steady source of water. And the Nile would receive waters from all the rainfall that would happen to you know, fall in other places and would feed into the rivers that would enter into the Nile before it enters into the sea. And this is where, in the Egyptian culture, especially at that time, the Nile was seen as a source of life. The Nile was seen as one of the Egyptian gods. And the annual flooding of the Nile was so dependable that Egypt rarely suffered from such an extended famine. So that would mean that a seven-year famine would be one of two things. One, either the Egyptian god of the Nile is restrained. Somehow, the god of the Nile is overpowered, weakened by a greater god, or very likely the god of the Nile is angered. But who would anger the god of the Nile? Very likely, the blame would have been on Pharaoh, much like you would blame the president for inflation, when very likely a lot of factors play into it, but we often turn to the president. But here, it's interesting. Joseph is speaking as a prophet, and throughout the Bible, you see that famine is often used by God as a form of punishment. And if there is famine as a form of punishment, there generally is only one thing that you should do. It is repent. It would be natural for Pharaoh to repent in some way, to atone for the wrong in some way, to appease the God of the Nile in some way. But Joseph speaks nothing of this. Pharaoh had done nothing wrong in this sense. And one of the reasons why we see this is because there is also, before the seven-year famine, a seven-year period of plenty, an equally long seven-year period. And so the two events do not clearly indicate that the gods of Egypt are angry. But, however, there is no neutrality in this message. And there is no neutrality about the messenger. Joseph is speaking as a prophet from the Lord, not as one of the gods of Egypt. He is not, Joseph is not here a magician or a prophet of Egypt, a seer, a wise man. 
Joseph speaks of Pharaoh's dream, and he reveals that it has come from God. And so, what does this mean? If the God of Egypt, the God of the Nile, is not angry, then it must mean there is a greater God. There is a greater God than the God of the Nile. And this is exactly what Pharaoh must accept. See, up till now, the magicians of Egypt were powerless. They are powerless to interpret Pharaoh's dream and they were impotent in their ability to do anything that could satisfy Pharaoh. Pharaoh himself is helpless. He turns to everyone. He turns to all of his wise men and there is no one who can help him. No one could explain it to him, he says in verse 24. And this is exactly what we see in the parallel in Daniel chapter 2. There too, the king of Babylon is just as powerless as Pharaoh is here in Genesis 41. So is Belshazzar in Daniel chapter 5, when the handwriting came and wrote the message of God on the wall. They could not know the mystery of heaven. They were powerless to tap into this revelation. So one of the things that we see in Genesis 41 that Pharaoh must realize is that he cannot rely on worldly wisdom. He cannot rely on the powers of this world. He cannot rely on the gods of Egypt to sustain his empire because they would be hamstrung, they would be crippled. He could not even rely on himself as Pharaoh. No, but what he must do instead is he must believe that Joseph is a prophet of God. He must believe in the revelation of God and he must believe in the wisdom of God that is given to Joseph. This is true from what we see at that time in ancient days, and it is still true today. The wisdom of this world cannot compare to the wisdom that comes from God. In all the world's wisdom, it cannot know God because the greatest wisdom of this world is nothing compared to God, even compared to what we would describe as his foolishness. Because you see, the wisdom of this world seeks and looks for power in empty things, in things that are ultimately doomed to pass away. And as Christians now, We need to recognize this. We should not find certainty in things that are temporary. You shouldn't rely on things that cannot last. It's like hiding from a bullet behind a piece of paper or hiding from a tornado in a glass greenhouse. It's to put your faith in your own wisdom, in your own degrees, or in your resume of what kind of companies you would put on your resume. It is to put your security things like quicksand and that you would plant and build yourself and set your house on quicksand. Ultimately, the wisdom of this world, you see its foolishness in the way that it rejects 
Christ and the message of Christianity. This is clear today. And the message of Christianity is now seen as narrow minded, as foolish, to try to champion and be morally right as Christians to the world is utter foolishness. And there are many in this world who think themselves as morally right without the cross of Christ. But the thing is, without Jesus, no matter how right a person thinks they are, on Judgment Day, it matters very little. They think themselves to be wise because of your degrees or because you work in Silicon Valley. It makes you elite, it makes you an intellectual. But no matter what kind of resume you have, what kind of transcript you have, is that your confidence on judgment day? Is that your confidence before the throne of God when you have to give an account of your life? What will you say to Christ when he comes to judge the world? What is your confidence? The wisdom of the Christian knows that the only confidence that we can have is in the cross of Jesus Christ. Knowing the power of Jesus Christ and his cross, and to know the cross deeper should be our greatest aim. To seek the Lord of glory who was crucified. Our desire should be to not only know this, but to follow in this way. Because the cross is the only way that we can know the fullness of God's plan as he uses it to defeat the sins in our lives, the idols of our hearts, so that we would comprehend the wonders of God's grace. This is the aim of the Christian. This is what Pharaoh recognized. You see, Pharaoh could not rest in the wise men of Egypt. Pharaoh had to reject it. Pharaoh could no longer rest in the power of the God of the Nile. He had to rest in the wise men that came from God who was a slave, a servant, who was a captive prisoner. And so too must you. You must rely on the one who came into this world, not to bear the crowns of glory, not to receive honor and majesty, but the one who came in humility, the one who came and was humbled and was crucified. Your confidence must not be in the wisdom of this world, but your confidence must be in the one who comes to be our wisdom. Christ who has come down to be for us true heavenly wisdom. And knowing Christ and knowing his cross this is enough to satisfy all the answers that challenge the message of the gospel. Because you recognize the wisdom of God is greater than all. That even when you cannot understand, even when the world seems to be perishing, even when you think Everything around you is uncertain. Even if the ground beneath you was uncertain, you would be confident because you stand upon Christ and He is the rock of your life. 
And when you stand on Christ, you cannot be shaken. You cannot be moved because Christ has become our all in all. Let me read to you from 1 Corinthians chapter 1 what the Paul, Apostle Paul writes about the cross and of this world's wisdom. And we'll end with this. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 18 reads, For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. But to us, who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God the world did not know God through wisdom, just as we see in Genesis 41. Please God, through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demanded signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Christ who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Is your life uncertain? Do you find certainty? What is it that you rely on? What is it that makes you great? Is it because you are of noble birth? Is it because you are wealthy? Or you are receiving titles? What is it? Accept Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ alone must be your rock, your sure foundation, so that no matter what kind of storms this world might throw at you, no matter what kind of uncertainties you might face in your life, you should know there is only one rock. That rock is Christ. Let us pray.